If, if you can remember where you were in the Bible last week, you're going to be in the exact same spot again. So if you can recall that we were in the book of James, I encourage you to turn to that exact same book yet again. Except today we're going to dive headlong into the passage of James that was the reason Martin Luther called it the right straw epistle and for a time was willing to make the argument that perhaps James be vacated from the canon and not included in the Bible because of his difficulty with this one pa passage. And, and before I go too far in it, let me note that it's just a random thing, but this Bible is, is what I refer to as a preaching Bible. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't move this one around. It stays right here. There are two Bibles upstairs and about 30 downstairs, but this one lives right here. It stays right here. And so maybe not all the pages have been turned quite yet, and I found it funny this morning as I was putting everything in order that the page that this passage is on was still stuck together with the other one, almost as though you could see why it would, oh, I just skipped that all the time because that page wouldn't come apart. You had to pry it open. This is a passage that people like to skip because this is a passage where I find it easy to understand that James was trying to say what he had heard his brother say so often. This takes work. Living the way we've been called to live takes work. And if you're not finding yourself doing the work, James is simply having the guts to ask us, then do you really live the life you think you live? Now he says this in a way that became very famous for people who were worried about something called legalism. And legalism is the idea that there are musts, that you must do this thing and you must do that thing and you must do those things over there. And if you skip any of that, God will turn his face from you and you shall not enter into eternity. So you must be baptized. You must um, travel to Jerusalem in your, once in your lifetime. You must pray five times a day. If you don't do those musts, then God is no fan of yours. That would be called legalism. And if you could find scripturally where the Bible was preaching legalism, you would have trouble because there are many passages in which the Bible simply says, believe, have faith, receive what has been given. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, brings up the topic of faith and work. Are they irrevo irrevocably connected? Are they separate and forever never to touch? Or is there more here than just a simple defense of legalism versus, forgive me, but this is the correct term and uh, verbiage, the bastardization of, this, of the gospel that has happened so often in modern time, where all you got to do is pray after me and then go about your business unchanged whatsoever, it's all fine. James... James is the kind of guy who, if he was in a church setting where someone said that, he was the kind of attitude that probably would have stood up that moment, rebuked that statement, and then entered into this discourse. And he's writing to a specific audience, and they have a problem. And it's an extremely similar problem to one we have today in this world. The idea that I can tell you something with my mouth, but it's none of your business if my life lines up with what you just heard. And so James doesn't make an argument that some people want him to make. In fact, people who have legalistic attitudes towards faith, like there are things you have to do, they will use this passage as their support. They will pull it out of its context and say, see that James, the Bible then says to us, if you're not doing these things, then you're dead. You're going to hell. It's not what he says, but let's make sure we know that so that we can hear what he says and be different. Again, haunting as it may seem, every one of these things that we've shared together over the past few Sundays in January, all coming from Jesus saying, strive. Strive for this. Agonize yourself over this. Study this. 
James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. For many of you will not be new, it will not be foreign. But would you hear it again, or perhaps for the first time, what James shares with us, what the Bible shares with us about faith and work? Beginning in verse 14, the Bible says this. What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and and then one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, then what use is any of that? In the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe it and shudder. But are you willing to acknowledge, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless? Was our father Abraham not justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, And Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was Rahab the prostitute not justified by works also when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Now I can imagine, though I am just making it up in my mind, that without a full understanding, now living in 2024, we have such a wealth and a context of hindsight and of study and of having the Bible in our own native language our entire lifetimes and the lifetimes of our grandparents and the lifetime of their grandparents and the life all the way back till further than any of you and I care to discuss over 400 years of English translations, over 400 years of English trans. We know nothing of the struggle to understand something without it just being spoken in my what's called native tongue, or my heart language. Luther didn't have that privilege. He had to learn Greek to read the Greek. He had to learn Latin to read the Vulgate, and he had to translate it on his own. And when he came to this, inside of its context of the struggle he was having in his day with the Catholic Church teaching through their dogma, you must do this, you must do this. Well, here this discussion that James is having, he's troubled and burdened because it looks like it's supporting that. And yet Paul says all over the place, you're saved by faith alone and not of works. So the problem would be a contradiction. And if you find one contradiction in the Bible, the whole Bible falls apart, almost as though its threads would unravel right before you and the pages fly away, which is why over 2,000 years of study have yet to find a single one, because guess what? You can't find what isn't there. But let's be clear about something for those who might have heard this and might think. And I, I tell my class this all the time. I want to know that I'm wrong so that I can be right. I don't want to live wrong and die in error. So let's make sure we know what James doesn't say here. So James is saying, the Bible is saying something to us about faith and works or deeds or what you do. He is saying something here. But what is he not saying? Well, what he's not saying is what most people say. So I have a little quote here that I've heard people offer plenty of times. Chapter 2 of James proves that you have to work or earn salvation from God. That James is proving that. But what's the counter to this? Is that accurate? It says that seemingly. Well, if we were to turn back one chapter into chapter one, the same guy who people want to suppose is saying you have to do certain things to gain access into heaven, well, that same author prior to chapter two in chapter one, verse 21 says this, therefore ridding yourself of uh, of all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. The word implanted. So you, you didn't plant it. We'd have to study Greek again, but he's noting that someone else did. So the word implanted, that's a fancy way of saying faith. And the someone else that planted it is God. So James is saying, you 
have to have the word implanted in you. You can't, you can't plant it. You can't go dig it up and find it and hoard it and make a little hole in your heart and then put it there. You can't do this. You have to receive the word implanted. You have to have it given to you. That's what we understand salvation to be. Receiving the word implanted is different from earning the word implanted, you see? So James can't be contradicting himself from one chapter to another. And before all of this discussion about faith and works, James says, receive it. Then James chapter 2 becomes what you're doing with it. Now this has a counterpoint in what his brother, what Jesus the Savior would have taught and did teach it was recorded for us in John chapter 8. In John 8 and verse 39, Jesus is responding to the Pharisee who he's been fussing at. And he's fussing because they're not living in accordance with what they know and what they teach. And to rebuke Jesus' rebuking, the Pharisees say to him, We are sons of Abraham. Because you will recall, perhaps, weeks ago, there was a man who came to Jesus and said, so are you saying not a lot of people go to heaven? And we, we learned together he would have believed that simply by being Jewish, he was walking straight in the front door. And so that's why the Pharisees, believing the same thing, in fact, would have been the people to teach that man. They say, we are sons of Abraham. In John 8, 39, Jesus says, well, it says that. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. We are children of Abraham. And Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. Another way to translate that is, if you are the children of Abraham, you would do the deeds of Abraham. So in other words, just because you say you're something doesn't mean you're something. And if you tell me what you are, but I see you doing the things that betray what you said, then something's wrong. Perhaps you're not what you say you are. No, but I am. Well, then do that. Do what you say. A pilot flies a plane, but I wouldn't expect a pilot to be in the driver's seat of a submarine. So you would even say to that person sitting in the submarine chair, I thought you said you were a pilot. You do what pilots do in the air with an airplane. Well, some of us say, I believe in Jesus. And let me tell you the same thing I recently told my class and I've told you before. That is an empty and pointless question today. It doesn't matter if you believe in him. Muslims believe in him. And historians who are purely atheists believe in him, in his existence, in his reality. What matters is what you believe about him. Is he your savior and your king? If he is, then your life and mine ought to reflect a life of servitude because I belong to him. I have received the claim he has made over my life. So what James is not saying is that you have to buy, earn, or work your way into heavenly acceptance. What he is saying, though, what he is saying is yet again another time that I can sit still with my creator and see there's something I need to be working on. No one in here is doing this completely right. From the top, most holiest of us, whoever pops in your head, okay, they might be sitting right beside you, they might not even be here today, whoever did the holiest person in here to the lowest, dirtiest scumbag, none of us are doing this completely right. Every one of us needs to hear what he's saying. So my prayer all week long and even before is that we would be clearly understood in our stillness to hear the words that, we're being, that are being spoken over us. Not for me, I'm not a big deal that's been there this whole time. So what does James say? And let's be clear about number one before we trouble ourselves going any further. Salvation comes only by God and only through God. Salvation comes only by God. So it's not what you do and it's not what you say. In fact, it isn't faith that brings salvation. Faith is the receptance. Is that a word? It is the receiving of it. Faith is the receiving of salvation, but it isn't where it came from. 
God is where it came from. Work is not where you get salvation. Work is the result of that salvation. But salvation only comes from and through God. There is none of me or none of you involved. Why is it important to see that distinction? Because some people will go so far as to say, oh, well, if you tell me I have to have faith, faith is a work. Faith is a deed. I, believing is a thing I have to do. Right? But it's not. You ever had somebody give you something? And did you think to yourself when you were being given something, boy, it took a lot of work to receive that. You know, and I'm coming to bring you a million dollar check. You're like, oh, 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 this, uh, okay. No, you just received it. And if there's no, I'm not buying something from you or I'm not paying you back. If somebody said, why did he give you that? I don't know, he just did. That's faith. Faith is just receiving openly, freely. Well, then the Bible says you have to confess with your mouth. Yeah, that's the result of the faith being in, that's the word implanted that John's talking about. You start talking about it, you start sharing it, you start living it because it's there. Not so that it would be there. So faith is the acceptance of grace. Work is the result of it. But I want you to hear what somebody way smarter than me, his name is Kurt Richardson. He wrote uh, uh, the New American Commentary on the book of James. He says this, in regards of understanding salvation's source in God, for us, he says, we must understand that faith that does not contain within it the will or spring of action appropriate to faith is dead. So if I say I believe in Jesus, but I don't have the slightest desire to know anything about him or the slightest desire to do the things he's commanded or the slightest desire to be told I do know that you believe in him, but what you're doing is wrong and you got to stop. Oh, no, mind your business. The author of that commentary says, then that's, you have to look at that and say, that's dead. The problem is, we've learned really well how to look at dead things and think they're alive. Or at least want to convince ourselves that they are. I don't mean to be weird or gross. <clears throat> but have you ever gone to a visitation? And if you stare at the casket long enough, you are convinced you just saw them breathe. Like you, you think. You might, I remember the very first time I can recall experiencing this, I looked around like, is anybody else seeing my grandmother breathing? Because, uh, what? And some people might even go up like, okay, okay. Now that's part of the habit of our brains expecting to see motion. But, you know, if I... I see someone in the casket, and I'm like, no, I promise I saw them. I want to convince myself that it's a lie, that, that someone is alive. Or I think I see that happening, and so I'm like, oh, oh. now I have reason, so I think, oh, that's not true. I know, what the, I know what's happened between their passing and now, and, and it's not true that they're breathing. But, but even the idea entering my head of, hey, did that just happen? Well, see, we take that to extremes when we look at the way we or our friends, our neighbors, our family behave. And we're excusing it away like, oh, yeah, it's fine. They're alive in Christ. It's fine. Now, again, this is a, this is a, this is a skinny tightrope for me or anyone trying to comprehend this to walk on. Because you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. But the problem is we're so obsessed with saying that over and over, but you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it that we miss the fact that God said, but I want you to do it. I'm asking you to do it. Heaven forbid, but it's actually in the Bible. I am commanding you to do it. Well, I can't proclaim surrender to the king of kings and be disobedient to the king. My life can't be that. So I have to recognize that first faith, just the reception of grace. Then work comes, the result of that receiving, but salvation itself. Me being set free from death, it doesn't come by faith. It comes by God. Through faith, we might understand, but it's God, the originator. Faith and works are how I experience that. But we get to the meat, perhaps. 
Everybody needs to look themselves in the face and realize that just because you say so doesn't mean so. You can tell yourself, you can tell your spouse, you can tell your family, you can tell your best friend in the whole wide world how in love you are with Jesus, but just because you said it doesn't mean it's true. And the worst part about it is when we can't stop lying to ourselves. Now, I want you to look at verse 19 because it is an interesting thing he says that sometimes just seems like a shock factor, but he's calling attention to the problem and trying to help us understand how deep this issue goes. For some people, the understanding of their relationship with Jesus is the surface level of simply saying, yes, I believe in Jesus. We might add to that, yes, I believe that Jesus is my Savior. That that's all they say, but as I examine their life, I see nothing that reflects let me re, I'm going to take that back in and say it this way. I examine my life. Maybe we don't have to worry about other people so much. So I say I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That's how he's proclaimed in the Bible. My Lord and my Savior. My King and my Redeemer. I have surrendered to him like that, but I examine my life and I, but I don't, that's where it stops. That's where it stops. I don't show grace to others. I, don't, I haven't forgiven somebody in years. I continue to feed the habits that all over the Bible, the preacher brings them up every Sunday. I continue to feed those without a care. It doesn't bother me because mind your business. Well, see, all of a sudden, verse 19 is trying to call my attention. So notice what he says in that verse. You believe that God is one. In other words, you, you have made a profession of faith. You believe that God is one. You have stated your awareness of God. And then he says, good job. The demons say the same thing. You see? Every devil in hell believes that God is one. Every devil in hell believes that Jesus is his only begotten son. Every demon in the flames and the pit know that he was resurrected. And they all say that as James puts it. They all say, yeah, I know. What's the difference? They don't do anything with that wisdom. They don't do anything with that knowledge. And so James is saying, if all you've got is what you said, then you're just like them. They, they know it too. Now see, all of a sudden, when I understand what he's trying to say, he's just kicked me in the gut. Because I certainly, I highly doubt that any of us in this room would consider ourselves demons. I know that none of us would think, oh yeah, I mean, I got a foot, I got one foot and half the other one in hell. No. I mean, good Lord, we're in church, preacher, cut us some slack. But James is saying, okay, you know that God is. You know that Jesus is. Great, the demons know that too. And you combine that in his argument about what you believe versus what you do, and you see what he's trying to call your attention to is your mouth and your behavior match or one of them is lying. And which one do you think most often is lying? What we say or what we do? Jesus said, out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth will speak. In other words... What you say is tied directly, intimately with who you are. But when we try to put this filter in front of me, like, no, I'm, I'm a Christian. Why is the word Christian so meaningless today? If not because so many people using it haphazardly who did not believe at all. Who certainly didn't desire to be, as the word first meant, a little Christ. A, a, an imitation almost, a reflection of the Savior. Just because I say something doesn't mean it's so. But we use the saying to try to ignore that our souls <laughs> don't line up. Now you come visit, you come visit the joy house today. You walk into the kitchen, and it looks like we murdered the dishwasher because it's fallen over on its side in the middle of the floor. And the reason it's fallen over on its side is because of a cascade of broken parts. An impeller broke, a, 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 a some other thing broke. And so here's, here's what we affectionately call the P 
pastor and pops repair service. Pulling this thing out, turning it over, spilling water everywhere. But we got that impeller changed and we got that pump piece changed. And I even put it all back together with no spare screws. And we slide that thing back in there and, and it's time to test it. It's time to see is water going to shoot out of those little spinning arms at the bottom. And so we turn it on and I can hear water shooting around inside of it. And I've put a test coffee cup on the top rack up uh, with the opening facing up because if it's got water in it when I open the door, that means water was shooting around and I'm excited to check it. But I think to myself, hmm, I better look underneath. And so I lay back down on the floor and I peer underneath and lo, there were a puddle forming. The drip was this kind of drip. Just like that. You know what I could have done? Could have put that base piece on. Could have tightened those little locks. Could have shut the door and said, fixed it. And guess who would have known? Nobody. Because you can't see under there. I mean, don't let me fool you. We're not normally on the floor in the kitchen at our house looking under appliances. We don't do that. So I could have come out and said, fixed it. And I'd have been a hero for the day. Boy, Mason, you did such a good job. And I'd, I'd, even, I'd have gone fishing for a compliment. I'd have gone up to my wife later and been like, so did you hear I fixed the dishwasher? And she'd be like, I'm so proud of you, honey. I'd be like, <laughs> except what would I know? What would I know? It's dripping under there. You know when everybody else would know? When the floor rots through and that thing falls into the, into the foundation. Because just because I said it was fixed didn't mean it was fixed. And I saw that it wasn't fixed. Now, do you think, especially fellas, handymen, now y'all might love this stuff. I can't stand it. Do you think that when I saw it leaking, I was like, oh, great, we get to take it back out and check some more stuff? No. So I took it out, took the parts off, pry at this grommet piece, and that's when I pushed it and see a crack that's letting water leak out of that grommet. And I'm like, we need something else. Now I'm going to get that grommet on Wednesday. I'm going to shove it back in that dishwasher. I'm going to put all those pieces together. I'm going to dry everything. I'm going to put it back. I'm going to test it again. And I am going to, with fear and trepidation, put my head on the floor. And if I see a drip, you know what I can be tempted to do again? No, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. She said, call an appliance man. That's what I will do. What I could be tempted to do is the same thing I just said I could have been tempted to do the first time. I say, we did it, Pop. We fixed it. Put it away and let it be a problem for somebody else some other time. Now take that same example and apply it to your life. You know there's something dripping. You go around telling everybody you're fine. And then one day you're going to fall through the floor. James says it does no good just to rely on what you say. Because what you say is manipulated. If I keep going in, chapter, in, in James, and forgive me for not knowing dead to rights, but I think it's chapter 4, where he says the tongue is on fire from hell. Mankind can tame every beast on earth, but he cannot tame his own tongue. Our words are betrayers. We lie and we cheat with our mouth. So James says, if that's the source of your faith, just what you say, your say-so, doesn't mean so. So what do I do then, good sir? If just because I say I believe, he isn't saying that that's not good. He's saying that's not all. So he goes on to point out that deeds become a function of your faith. What you do isn't earning you grace. It is a result of you having received it. And so here's why this becomes offensive to so many people. Because by calling attention to how we behave, we're telling and have been telling the whole time to anyone who would pay attention, hey, we're lying to you when we tell you how much we love God. And nobody wants to be a liar, even on the smallest of scales, much less a liar when you're telling me about your relationship with God. But yet Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know them. Fruit is a symbol for deed in the New Testament. Why didn't Jesus say, by what they say to you, you will know them? 
Why didn't he say, by the words that escape their mouth, you will know them? He said, by their fruit, by what they do, by how they treat people, by how they treat themselves, by how they expect to be treated, that's how you'll know what they are and who they are. Our deeds are a function of our faith. Now, James calls attention to two people, but I'd love for you to recognize something. One of them is the father of all fathers, and one of them is a Gentile prostitute. Abraham is a reasonable expectation for an example, because he's Abraham. I mean, this is the man. Abraham, his name means father of many. And God told Abraham, look at the stars in the sky. I will make your generations like that, countless. Before his name was changed by God, his name was, in Hebrew you say Avram, but it's Abram in English. That means father. Avram means father of many. When God was fulfilling the promise that he made, he changed him. He changed his name. This is Abraham. The patriarch, the father of Isaac, the grandfather of, I mean, Jake, you know, this is the guy. And does James use him as an example and say, don't you know how many times Abraham told people that he believed God? Don't you know that he, every time he stopped and found a stranger, he was like, hey, I believe in Yahweh. And the stranger was like, what? Amazing. He doesn't say anything about what Abraham said. He says, don't you know that Abraham's faith was justified, meaning proven, meaning established as fact, when he took Isaac up that hill? Abraham had said, I trust you, God. Abraham had said, I'll go anywhere you tell me, God. And he proved that, by the way, by leaving his people, his, his land, and his nation. He, he left everything he knew. He lived in what would become modern-day Babylon. He lived there in the beginning of his story, and God takes him all the way to where modern-day Israel is today, basically, in Egypt. That's a far, long way where people didn't speak his language, and he knew no one. So did he trust God? Yes. How do I know? Because he packed up and left. Not because he told all of his neighbors, man, I really trust God. How do I know Noah trusted God? Because he kept talking about a storm coming or because he built a boat? How do I know it? How do I see it displayed for me? James is talking about how I can see the display of what someone proclaims is true. So Abraham is justified when he's walking up that mountain with Isaac. Rahab, a Gentile. Why would he use a Gentile? Because who you are and where you're from don't matter. Rahab in the King James version is known as the harlot. That's a Nice King James word for, unfortunately, a prostitute. And she lives on the wall. She lives inside the wall of Jericho. Walls would have been two layered things at least, and they had a walkway and sometimes rooms, and so she lives in what we would call today a modern loft apartment, I suppose. Well, she told the spies who went into Jericho that she was a God-fearer. She was aware of Yahweh, and she believed in him. And so she was supporting those men in their spying out of the city. Well, because she could have said that and then turned them over to the authorities. If she had turned them over to the authorities, do you think she was telling the truth when she said, I, I, I believe in Yahweh? I mean, her deeds don't match that. Since that's Yahweh's people, she's turning over to the cops. Instead, what did she do? She hid them. She even lied and said, I don't know where they went. Oh, no, never mind. They went that way. And she let them down by a rope out of her window. You can find that, by the way, in Joshua chapter 2, verse 4, 6, and 15. Three times. One, she hides them. One time she says, I don't know where they are. And another time she lets them out the window. So how do I know that she was committed to protecting those men? Because she said she wanted to protect them. No, because she did protect them. She did what she said was true. What you do testifies to your belief. What your mouth says is just an introduction at, uh, to your belief at best. Last one. Faith and work. One does not exist without the other. 
This is in verse 26. He says, for just as the body without the spirit is dead. So that thing that's you, that you can't touch, where does it live? Here, 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 I don't know. But that thing, your spirit, you might use the word soul. You might believe in a Trinitarian idea of a human, that you're a body, spirit, and soul. You might see it as, a, as the ancient Hebrews did, that there's the flesh on the outside, but then there's me. And I, they would have said that you dwell in your heart. If I ask you, where do you reside, you probably, as a modern person, would say, here, you know, because this is where we feel like our thoughts originate. It doesn't matter. One without the other does not give me a living person. If I go back to that funeral home where I thought my grandmother was breathing, she wasn't because she was dead. There was no spirit in her any longer. I can't have my spirit and my body separated and be living. All of us are alive because those two things are combined. James says, though, in verse 26, you all know this, he said. That's understood to his audience. You all know that you can't have one of these and not the other and call that person alive. They must have a body and they must have a spirit in them. So just like the body without the spirit is dead, he says, so also faith without work, without deeds, is dead. Maybe James is just the kind of guy who has a really bad attitude about things. Maybe, maybe somebody did him wrong, and so he was angry at people who claimed to be Christian. And that happens. In fact, when I was young, I second-handedly learned a lesson from my parents. If you have someone come to your house to agree to do work for you, like lay bricks around your flower bed or create a sidewalk out of your front door to the street, and you're like, can you give me a price on this? And they're like, sure. And they go look around and they say, hey, before I give you this quote, man, I just want you to know I'm a good Christian man and I love the Lord and whatever. Immediately my dad's like, red flag, that guy's going to try to rip me off. <laughs> so if they brought up loving Jesus, it was like, nope, <laughs> no, you're not laying my sidewalk. Now why did he have that opinion? Because multiple times someone had claimed how much they loved Jesus and then proceeded to rip him off. This is why, by the way, so, this isn't a new problem. The most famous of C.S. Lewis's books, do you happen to know the name of it? It's one of those that everybody loves to say, they, oh yeah, I've read that, and half <laughs> people haven't read it. Do you know his most, not the Chronicles of Narnia, by the way, okay, what's his most famous religious book? Participatory Church. Screw tape letters, that's a good guess, but no. Mere Christianity. No, he's an Anglican. So if you've actually read Mere Christianity, he will say there are things that make someone Christian that you will probably be like, eh, I don't think so. Purgatory being one of them. He thinks that an understanding and acceptance of purgatory's existence is, is kind of a requirement. Uh, I don't think so. Who am I to be like standing up here castigating C.S. Lewis? I'm nobody, but I don't believe that. I think he's wrong. He's gone beyond essentials. But Mere Christianity, he's trying to answer the question, what's the bottom line? What's that word mean anymore? Adrian Rogers tried to do it, what every Christian ought to know. Herschel Hobbes did it. Lots of people have done it. Brother Mason did it to get a degree. I walked you through the five essentials of a biblical worldview, which are the five essentials of Christianity. Is the Bible true? Does God exist? Who am I and what am I? Do I have a problem? Who is Jesus and did he fix it? Everything else. We like to chew on, but it doesn't matter. One of the things, though, inside of being fixed is realizing that I can't be fixed and not be fixed. <laughs> I can't be fixed, but then not be fixed. Go back to my dishwasher. I can tell you that it's fixed, but it's not because it's dripping water. It doesn't matter if you can't see it. I know it's dripping can't be fixed. Unless, I can't say that it's fixed and it not be fixed or I'm a liar. Just like I can't say I love God and not love God, I would be a liar. But again, maybe, maybe James is a grump. Maybe he's just mad. You know, he's like my dad. Ah, you people keep telling me you believe, but you're trying to rip me off. Yeah. And so he wrote this. 
Well, Paul had the same thing to say. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, listen, I am so sorry. If this is like, man, quick, get off this subject, get off my neck. Why is it in the Bible so much? Why, if you actually look, does it say so many times, test yourself, work out your faith with fear and trembling, strive to enter the narrow way, seek the narrow door? I mean, why does it bring it up so much? Because it's a problem. If you've never heard, hear it now. If it's repeated, it's for emphasis. And if it comes up over and over and over how you better make sure that you are what you tell people you are. You better make sure that you believe what you believe. You better make sure these things are true because there comes a time where there isn't any more fixing. Where you can't be like, well, I was lying. I need to fix it. Now, this, this popularized, a long time ago this was popular, the deathbed confession. Well, what if you die? I mean, and really people be like, I'm just going to live however I want because, you know, when I get old and die, a priest will come and I can be, I can say, you know, the, 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 the last rites and I can confess my sins and pff, everything's fine. Well, what was the known, what was the obvious problem there? How do you know you're going to die in your bed with a priest? What if you just drop dead of a widow maker? What if you have a, well, they wouldn't have had this problem, but what if you have a car wreck? You know, all the classic preacher tropes. What if you walk outside and get hit by a bus? Or in our case, a log truck. Right? What happens? You go, it's too late. Well, I thought I had time. The sad, sorrowful song of every, every, every human who doesn't understand that time is not something you've ever had in your life. James says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. You think he just means test to see if you say it? Test yourself to see if you say out loud, I love Jesus. Oh, I'm in. You think that's what he means? He goes on. Remember, if it's repeated, it's important. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. Or don't you recognize this about yourselves? Don't you recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test? Why do you take tests? Isn't a test to estimate and show what you do know and then by nature shows what you didn't? Paul isn't saying test yourself so you can be embarrassed in public. Test yourself so that you can be filled with shame. Test yourself so that all you are is embarrassed. Paul is saying test yourselves because I don't want you to live in a terrible marriage. Test yourself because I don't want you to die tomorrow and go to hell thinking you had it all right. Test yourself because I don't want you crying at night because you know how broken life is, but you don't want to tell anybody you need help. Test yourself and see, because you shouldn't be afraid. That's why he says, don't you know this about yourself that Christ, Jesus Christ is in you? He's saying that because why would I be afraid of the test if I knew I was going to pass? Now, I've taken plenty of tests in my life and been afraid of them. Because did I study enough? Do I know enough? Will I remember enough? There wasn't a single Greek or Hebrew vocabulary test that didn't involve me writing my name at the top and then putting my pencil down and saying, Lord, you know that I have no idea what I'm doing. Not one. Why, why would I be afraid of it? And I would turn it in. And I, I said, he's, a, he, 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 he's a cherished Friend, a supporter of Becky and I, when, when I first surrendered to ministry, a man named Dr. Daniel Hall, he supported us and directed me, and he's a, he's a goober like me a little bit, and he, he, he tells me that my Braden and Macy's names are Daniel and Danielle, because that would have been a better name for them, and I mean, he's just that kind of guy who also happened to be my Old Testament Hebrew professor. So I didn't mind telling him to us, I hate this. Oh, Mason, you need, to be a, you need to be an Old Testament linguist. I'm like, no, sir. If that's a requirement to heaven, I have bad news. I've never, I never liked it. And so when I would turn in those tests, I was terrified of what I might get back. I took an ethics test one time, and I was so nervous that I had studied and gotten Immanuel Kant and some other guy twisted backwards, and I was going to fail that test. I almost started crying before I clicked the link for the grade to pop up. 
I'm not a, I am, I was terrified, but I am not afraid to test my faith because I know, I know that I believe and I know that my life will reflect that belief. Now don't mishear something that you might want to hear now. I'm not telling you I'm perfect. Can you see, some of y'all don't have your spectacles on anyway, can you see a red spot right here in the web of my hand? Smiley, can you, can you see that? It's like, a, it's like a tiny red spot. Well, see, Pastor and Pop's repair service has a, has a rule. Somebody has to bleed. So while I was trying to tighten a clamp, that flathead screwdriver slipped off the clamp and stabbed. It went in my hand and then popped out. I may have said what some of you would say. I offer you that not to shame myself, but to let you know I'm not perfect. I've gotten angry, lost my temper. I can tell you a funny story about kicking a horse one time, a fake horse, not a real one, right in front of my kids. They can tell that story better than I can. But if you said, hey, Mason, can you prove that you love Jesus? Yep, I can. That's why Paul says, test it. Examine yourself. Don't you know that Jesus Christ is in you? So let's finish by saying, okay, preacher, what am I supposed to do? What exactly am I supposed to do? What if I'm sitting here listening to all these words out of the Bible and what I realize, but I'm not going to tell a soul. I'm going to go home and ask God or ask something, uh, lunch or a drink or a pill to help me forget this so that I can act like I don't know anymore and just keep saying that I love him, just keep saying that I know him, but I won't change anything and I don't want to examine anything. What am I supposed to do? Would you hear exactly what the Bible says you're supposed to do? Awake, sleeper, and rise from the dead. Wake up. Let Christ shine on you. Be careful how you walk, not as an unwise person, but as a wise person, and make the most of every day because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish. Understand the will of the Lord. Don't get drunk with wine that leads to debauchery. Fill yourself with the Spirit. Speak to people through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing melodies in your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and to our Father God. And subject yourself to one another and be fearful of Jesus Christ. What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to wake up. Stop lying. Stop pretending. It's okay to be wrong if you're ready to be right. But it's not okay to be wrong if all you're interested in doing is defending the wrong. And that's James's core argument. You're trying to defend that you believe by simply saying, I believe. When somebody comes to you in need and they're like, man, I'm, I'm hungry and I'm clothless, I'm cold. And James says, but all you do is say, go in peace, my brother. Be warm and full. What's really sad about that passage is that in the Greek, it says, make yourself warm. So James is being real clear that the person who claims to have faith is saying to that other person, not, I hope you get warm, go fix it yourself. Don't come to me. How many times have we turned someone away in need because we thought it wasn't our problem to fix? Certainly it's probably not, but have I been enabled to fix it? Should I help? Should I offer some sort of... Now, it doesn't mean, take, it doesn't mean that you're supposed to be taking advantage of it every turn. Don't, don't, don't receive it as though it goes all the way to some extreme. But he says, you keep telling how much you love him, but you won't do a thing he's asked. So then tell me, what good is it that you know? Even demons know. And at least they tremble in fear. You can't have one without the other. Your faith will be accompanied by work. Now I want to end with it being that direct because that's how direct the Bible is. And, again, I'm not, I'm not apologizing. Faith will produce work. Not should, 
Not ought to. It will. Because God says it will. God says that faith in him will produce good work. Now, good is by his definition, not ours. So peace, patience, joy, all all those things, they will be a part of me. Will be because he's with me. Because he is a part of me. And I can put that to the test and I can see, yep, there they are. Well, he has them more than I do. And I have them occasionally more than that. That doesn't matter. We have them. We will have them. If you're stuck thinking, well, it'll come eventually, so will your salvation. Because you don't have that yet. You can't have one without the other. I didn't say so. The Bible does. What do you do? You wake up. You wake up. You accept the truth. And you say, okay, preacher, I got problems. I don't want to tell you about them. I don't want to go into detail. I just want you to know I'm that one. I got problems. What am I supposed to do? Just wake up. Just wake up. Go through the list of letting go. What's one of your problems? This, but I didn't want to tell you that. That's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to go into any detail at all. Why can't we let it go? Let's talk about all the reasons we can't let it go out loud and see, does God come to any of those reasons and be like, oop, I can't deal with that. And once we've gotten that one down, let's move to the next one. Let's move to the next one until there's nothing in your way to do exactly what he's called you to do. Well, that sounds like a long process. Sometimes it happens like that. I've told you before, I want you to have the same sort of relationship that I have with him. If you're married, I want you to have the same spousal relationship that he's given me. If you're just a person, I want you to be as open to the way he sees it as some of the greatest men and women I've ever met are. Just, it's okay. Things are okay. Oh, but it's World War III and COVID-20 is coming out. I don't care. Because I am convinced that no height nor depth No power, no principality, nothing, nothing can stand against me and nothing can separate me from the the love of God. No weapon forged can harm this. And I know it. And you can know it. You know how heavy everything feels? It doesn't have to. Paul says, wake up. By the way, that was Ephesians 5 I was reading. Ephesians 5. This is one of those moments where I'm not 100% sure in the past 45 minutes if a single word that's come out of my mouth has made any sense. So what I hope, as always, is that the Lord speaks louder than I understand. But that we would all be willing to say, okay, test me. And if I get a 50, I need help. I'm not passing. Because he's there to help. I want to be wrong so that I can be made right. Tell me that I'm wrong, Father. Show me how I'm wrong. Or as I mentioned on Wednesday that David himself wrote in Psalm 51, you purge me and then I'll be clean. Wash me and I will become white as snow. Let's pray together. Almighty Father, I ask that of you and nothing more. That the words you have laid aside for all people from so long ago in this Holy Bible would speak loudly and profoundly over a subject that is often argued and too often avoided. And today, have we done it justice? I have no idea. Leave that for someone else to judge. But let our hearts be fully open to what you would say to us. That you have, in fact, called us and given us the ability to examine ourselves, to test what we claim, and to do so without fear. Because if we belong to you, we belong to you. And we will find that we are following the path you have set before us. 
And we are not here to argue for, ask for, or seek spiritual perfection. But that you pour encouragement over us who are desiring to go closer to you every day. And if at all there is in this room or within at any time the sound of my voice someone who is hurt because in the quiet, in the solitary place of their heart, they know that's a test they can't pass. Spirit, I pray you would speak loudest over them the words of peace. That thanks be to God, you grade on a curve and you give us the answer key in Jesus Christ. That we might be set free eternally, but that eternity includes right now. To be set free from burdens and set loose to live according to what you have commanded of us. I want to be convicted so that you can correct me and right my life. May we walk on that narrow way, not called to turn to the left or right. And may each of us this day in this room be granted the certainty of where we stand with you. In your holy name, I pray.